The bulb stabilized Wien Bridge Oscillator has a lot of appeal. It's an elegant circuit that produces a very high quality sine wave. And Bill Hewlett patented its use in a product that helped launch HP. What could be cooler? Many videos and sources do a good job of explaining this circuit, and some show it working, but few show its stabilization method in action, and fewer still show the problems you'll encounter if you try to build one. Let me warn you, this bulb stabilized oscillator is a twitchy circuit. It's hard to make it work perfectly. In this video, I'll show how the stabilization works and show you some of the problems that I've had. To start, let's look at the structure of a Wien bridge oscillator. The bottom part of the circuit is a positive feedback loop where two, two resistors and two capacitors, normally of the same value, choose the frequency of oscillation. The frequency will be 1 over 2 pi times r times c. And to get a high quality signal, you should find resistors and capacitors that are closely matched for this part of the circuit. It also ensures that the phase is correct to make oscillation work. The magic, in a sense, happens in the upper part of the circuit, the negative feedback loop. This part of the circuit has to make a gain of exactly three. If the gain is more than three, the oscillation will increase to the point of saturation. If the gain is less than three, it will decrease until it just dies out. You can make an oscillator by just using a potentiometer to set the gain. It's R4 in this schematic. The problem with this is that it's not a good circuit. It won't be stable. The gain has to stay exactly three, and things happen in the real world. Temperatures change, power supply voltages change, and these things throw off the gain and will then start it heading to saturation or decreasing to nothing. So the, the real trick in this circuit is to find a mechanism that automatically controls the gain to keep it at three. If you try this circuit, I think you'll find you can make it work, at least for a little while, but it's not worth any use in any serious application. The elegant solution is to use a, an incandescent lamp as a resistor. So in the circuit you see here, there's two resistors. The feedback resistor at the top, R3, is, is actually a potentiometer, so you can make adjustments. And then the resistor that sets the gain is the lamp. The special thing about the lamp is that its resistance will increase as the lamp heats up. Remember that the gain has to be 3, and the value of the gain will be 1 plus R3 divided by whatever the resistance of the lamp is. So suppose that the, uh, that the potentiometer is set to 500 ohms, and then a reasonable temperature for a heated lamp is 250 ohms. That gives you a gain of 3. Now suppose something happens that perturbs the system so that its gain becomes greater than three. That will cause the voltage in the negative feedback loop to rise and that will heat the lamp. That will increase the lamp's resistance. And the lamp's resistance going, going up means that the gain of the loop will go down and the circuit will go back towards having a gain of three. Similarly, if something perturbs the system and it starts running with a gain of less than three, the voltage will go down and the lamp will cool off and that will cause its resistance to decrease and that will increase the gain, allowing the system to return to a gain value of three. That's the sort of the magic of how this circuit works. Here's the first problem. What kind of lamp will work? Can your op amp heat your lamp up at all? What will its resistance be? Basically, you need to buy a lamp from a distributor like Mouser.com that sells lamps that have defined specifications. You should know at least the voltage and current specifications of your lamp. Here are two bulbs I've had success with. This is on Mouser's website. The first is a 7371, and the second is a 327. This bulb actually appears in several sources for recommendations for this application. The 7371 bulb has a nice advantage. It fits into diagonal holes of a breadboard, so you don't have to solder a wire or try to find a holder. I soldered wires onto the 327. Be careful not to heat it up so much it breaks. I was successful on the first try. If you want to build a bulb stabilized oscillator, I'd suggest buying some bulbs now. With modern LEDs, these bulbs have little reason to exist. They will just become harder and harder to find. In terms of specifications, I suggest looking for an 8 to 24 volt bulb that draws 25 to 40 milliamps of current when fully lit.
Note that the bulbs don't have to be fully lit. In fact, they don't have to be lit at all to be hot enough to work. The 7371 is a 12 volt bulb, so it's a little more likely to glow faintly while in operation. At the very least, that can be kind of fun. In my testing, I estimate that the 7371 draws up to 13 or 14 milliamps in operation. The next topic is which op amp to use. In my first experiments, I used op amps from a kit that I bought from Amazon. And I had troubles with these, including stability problems. With these op amps, you don't really know what you've got. So I decided to do some further research and I found two op amps, both of which looked promising and that I was able to buy from mouser.com. The first is the Linear Technology LT1037, and it looks promising for a very simple reason. Here's its data sheet. If I scroll down right on the first page, we see our oscillator recommended as a typical application. So that obviously looks good. I found my next recommendation in this book, Learning the Art of Electronics by Thomas C. Hayes. Uh, by the way, I recommend this book. It's intended to be a sort of companion to Horowitz and Hill's The Art of Electronics, but I think this book works standalone, and and it's quite a bit less intense. And, and if you look around, you might find a, a fairly affordable used copy. The book contains a very accessible write-up on, on our topic, the Wienbridge Oscillator. You can see our very circuit appears, although using a lamp that I believe is no longer made. The op amp that they used is the LF411. Here's the first page of its data sheet. It's a sort of modernized version of the 741. I've also had pretty good success with it. Here's the circuit built on a breadboard. The red and green wires that head to below the frame towards the bottom, they connect to a 1K potentiometer. In this close-up, you can see the lamp glowing faintly. This only happens when the potentiometer is set to maximize the amplitude of the output signal. The tests that we'll see next use the LF411 op amp, but both op amps operate pretty much the same. Let's turn the circuit on. And we see it come to life, showing a couple of sine waves. Channel 1, the orange, is the output of the circuit, and channel, channel 2, the purple, is the uh, negative input. And so the one should be one third the height of the other. Let's turn on some, well, first of all, let's look at the channel settings. So there are two volts vertical division for both. So you can get an idea there and uh, turn on some measurement. And we see that the frequency is a little over 1.6 kilohertz, which I think is consistent with our theory. And maybe the first thing to check is the amplitude of the signals. They should be exactly um, a factor of three different. So we have some statistics turned on here, which we should go to the measurement menu. And let's see here. And reset those statistics to make sure we get accurate values and just let them collect a little bit for the averaging. So we're seeing uh, 3.3. 995 volts for channel one. So if I take three point, no, let's not do that. Let's take channel two, 1.320, and divide that by 3.995, and we get 0.33. So kind of within the measurement capabilities of the device, exactly one third like we expect. And uh, let's see, maybe we can get that out of the way and go back to the channel. And notice that we're seeing some instability now. The amplitude is changing slightly. And that's the bugbear of this circuit, the, the problem that you often see. And it's hard to keep it from doing that all of the time. What, what helps to get in, in and out of that mode is to adjust the potentiometer, which uh, essentially adjusts the point at which the bulb has to adapt to to get a 3 to 1 gain. If we turn the potentiometer down, uh, first of all, it jumps around quite a bit, but the amplitude decreases. And if we turn the potentiometer up, the amplitude increases. And eventually, we'll start to clip. I see it's the bottom's clipping at this point. And, and then if we turn it down, um, just to make that clipping go away, that's usually a stable point in the circuit. Um, even with the cheaper op amps, I'd often find that the, the circuit would be stable close to the maximum. But let's try to turn it down quite a bit. So right now we're seeing a 15 volt peak to peak output. How far down can I get it to go? It's quite touchy with the potentiometer. This circuit 
is sort of almost barely stable, I think. So I can get it down a fair bit. And we're seeing that amplitude um, problem again. Let's zoom in a little bit. And you can see the amplitude's changing. And that's the trouble that's best avoided by, by running the circuit with a higher amplitude. Part of the issue that goes on here, I'm sure, is, is the nature of the lamp. The lamp has to change the gain to keep the gain at three. But how fast does it do it? I mean, this signal is a sine wave. It's constantly changing. If the lamp could change its heat sort of instantly at the same rate as the sine wave, it wouldn't work. It's actually important that it that it reacts much more slowly than the sine wave. But how much more slowly? That's, that's one of the things that's very hard to control in this circuit and makes it hard to design one that works absolutely perfectly well. So we turned it up again and made it pretty stable. And let's let's um, get a few more peaks in here. And um, let's take a look at the spectrum analyzer. So we'll turn the oscilloscope off and turn the spectrum analyzer on. And uh, you can see I was running this before. But we can get, get an idea of how clean the sine wave is. And it's pretty good. So we'll use this cursor here for the central to main frequency, the approximately 1.6 kilohertz, and the second one to this largest harmonic that we see. And we can see down here that this is 50 decibels down. And that's not bad. That's a pretty clean sine wave, especially because we don't see any other significant harmonics at all. Let's go back to the oscilloscope and get that running again and try to turn the volume down a little bit or the amplitude down using the potentiometer, which might induce that st instability that we've seen. And sometimes that takes a while to build up, by the way, that instability. And let's zoom in a bit. And let's go back to the uh, spectrum analyzer and run it. And so now we see things have changed a little bit. And the peak is somewhere around here. That gets hard to judge. And uh, the, the next harmonic is around here. So now we're actually showing 57 dB down. It's even cleaner. The signal tends to be cleaner when the amplitude's lower. And by the way, if that amplitude variation kicks in, uh, you won't see it on the spectrum an analyzer. It's essentially a very slow um, frequency, you know, way, way below the main frequency that, you know, that, that at which the amplitude varies. So back to the oscilloscope and run it. And yeah, and so you can see that we're actually in that mode now where the amplitude varies. If we zoom out, zoom out more, let's see how well we can see that with Scopey. Yeah, you can kind of get a sense for the frequency of, of this variation. So one thing that's also kind of fun to do is to, is to touch the circuit with your hands and see how it responds. Uh, let's see if I can get it to do it. Yeah, see, I can just kind of mess it up by touching the circuit with my hands. And you can see it recover to its point of stability here. And maybe I should, um, let's see, go back out. And let's go up to a higher amplitude again, where it runs without that amplitude variation. Let's go all the way to the point of clipping and come back down. And let's try perturbing the signal there just by touching the circuit. And you can see it comes back to its stable point pretty pretty quickly. So all in all, uh, with this op amp and, and this bulb, the circuit works pretty well as long as the amplitude's pretty high. And the, and the chief problem is, is that it gets into these modes where at low frequency, the amplitude changes. One more stability point I want to mention is that the bulb filament itself is a source of instability if there are mechanical vibrations and things. So one way to perturb the system is to just kind of gently tap the bulb. And you can see that that forces it to have to recover, and uh, which it usually does. Sometimes that will induce that low frequency amplitude variation, which, by the way, once it sets in, it, it at least does not quickly go away, even with warming up of the bulb and things like that.
This is a single shot capture of the oscillator at power on. Initially the bulb is cold, so the gain is high, and so the amplitude rapidly grows to the point at which it's clipping. And over time, the filament of the bulb heats up and the, and the gain can come down, eventually getting below um, three, actually below one, to, uh, to allow it to drop and stabilize around the gain of three that it actually requires. So you can see that on the right of the diagram. This is my experience so far with the bulb stabilized Veen bridge oscillator. The low frequency amplitude variations bother me. I'm concerned that vibration induced instability or even just loose breadboard connections may be a factor. I think I'll build a PC board containing this circuit to eliminate those mechanical issues. If I find something interesting, I'll make another video in a few weeks. Also, I've had good experience with diode stabilized Veen bridge oscillators. These produce less clean sine waves, but are, in my experience, easy to make stable. Maybe I'll make a video on them. I'll end this video here. Thanks for watching.